Okay. <clears throat> All right, welcome everybody. <clears throat> if you can hear me, raise your hand. I don't know why I say that every time, but uh, I just want to make sure people are awake at least. <clears throat> okay, so this is the second part in the series that uh, about using filling out the residential purchase agreement. We'll be going through some of the addendums and other forms that go along with it later. But at this point, um, I'm assuming that you, well, I don't know if I really should assume this, but you ought to have set up MLS Connect so that you can import information from the multiple listing service into the form. You should have set up templates so that when you're writing an offer, you don't have to fill out your information, your DRE number, the office information, and that you've done all that. Um, and uh, which of course, I'm sure from this group, you've done all of those things and you're ready to go. So now we're gonna actually talk about the bundle of forms that are part of the residential purchase agreement. And where I'm, where, the way I'm doing this is I'm going to essentially pretend, if that's the right word, that you're, a client, in fact, this might be easier for me to put it this way, um, that is curious, right? And has questions about the forms and how they work. Here, let me do that, right? And there's a copy of, uh, the, of the residential purchase agreement in the handout. If you're having trouble downloading it, uh, go to the zip forms and, and download, download your own copy, all right? And then we're going to, oh, it's probably not gonna let me do that. Let's just do this. I'll go back here. All right. Now, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of real estate agents don't understand the forms, right? They kind of sort of know how to fill them out. They know where to write in price and close of escrow date and a few other things. But if asked, can you explain to me what agent, what is this form about? They may not always have an articulate way of explaining it. So if I'm assuming, and sometimes clients don't care, right? They just say, just give me this stuff and let me sign it and let's get going. But I'm assuming that you have a curious client who actually would like you to explain the forms. So the way I, in the beginning is of course, agency disclosure. And the way I begin to explain this is I would say to the client, this is called agency disclosure. It's required by law that we go through this with you. This is not a contract, all right? What we're doing right now, this is not a contract. This is just a disclosure form. And the way to think of disclosure forms is they're like educational events, educational forms, right? And so what this form says is that there are three types of agency relationships. Now, if I'm representing the buyer, I would say, first of all, there's the seller's agent, that's the listing agent right? That's the agent who represents the seller. And what you need to know is, is that their job is to negotiate the highest price possible and the best terms possible for the seller. That's their job. They're supposed to be fair and honest with us as the buyer, but they're working for the seller and trying to get them the best deal. Then there's the buyer's agent. That's me. That's us. We represent you in the transaction, and our job is to negotiate the best price and terms for you, being fair and honest with um, the seller. And then there's um, a dual agent where we represent both the buyer and the seller, and that would occur if you were to buy one of my company listings. Right, and even though, or even my listing, but one of my company listings, because if you purchase a property listed by my brokerage, then we, you know, in the royal sense, I guess, of the word we, we are representing both the buyer and the seller and the transaction. Do you have any questions about that? All right, usually they say no. Great, let's go on. Now, the way I do this, and by the way, I had done this before COVID came, but the way I would be doing this is I, on the screen, sometimes would go through it with people, and then I'll tell them that at the end, if everything's okay and they understand, I'm gonna send it to them for electronic signatures, right? So at this point, we're not you know, signing it, but I always make sure I review a lot of contracts with real estate agents. And one of the first things I look for is to make sure that the proper 
proper boxes are checked here, right? Now, because the system knows that this is an agency form for a purchase agreement, it defaults, notice the seller and landlord isn't there, but uh, I could pick buyer or tenant, there's a buyer. If there were two buyers, you click twice. Now, this is required under the civil code. It's a copy of the civil code that relates to the first page of agency disclosure. I say that to people. This is a copy of the civil code that explains why we did that first page. And I actually tell people, if you have insomnia or something, this would be a good thing to read through, right? Just, you know, that uh, there's nothing to sign here nothing to do, nothing to initial. Now we come to fair housing and discrimination advisory. And what this says is that we're not supposed to be discriminating based upon a variety of factors, including race, color, creed, sex, national origin, ancestry, marital status, uh, disability, there's, there's quite a list. And that what this is simply a statement that the properties are to be sold as free as possible from any discrimination. And then that's the list of the different things that you're not allowed to discriminate on. So the seller is not allowed legally to discriminate against buyers based upon these particular characteristics. And if real estate, and, and this I don't spend a lot of time on, but basically this says that we, are going, this gives you an idea of what your rights are. And it says uh, that the agents aren't going to discriminate. And if they do, they could get into trouble, right? And I, you, I don't actually go through this line by line, but this will give the buyer uh, links to where they could get more information if they feel that they did not get the house or they did not, weren't able to rent something simply because of any of those factors, their race, their ancestry, whatever. Possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. This is called the PRDS, right? Um, and this is something I sometimes will spend some time on. And basically what this is saying is, is that even though I'm representing you to buy the house, let's say there are multiple offers. And some of the multiple offers are being written by agents that are part of my brokerage, right? Now, if I'm affiliated with a very large brokerage, that could, quite, that, that could be very possible that two agents from eXp or two agents from Coldwell Banker are writing an offer on the same property. And I would point out to the buyer that what that means is I don't have any control over what those other agents are doing. I don't know how much they're going to be offering, but you just need to understand we may be competing against other buyers represented by my company. Now, the part of this that becomes a little bit trickier and the rules differ depending on your brokerage. What if I've got two buyers that want to make an offer on the same property? Is that legal? ethical well it it depends on if you ask your broker you some of you might get an answer of yeah you can do that and some of you will get an answer no you can't do that and the reason why some will say no is because they may have had a problem in the past involving litigation and their errors and emissions insurance company has said you can't do that anymore and the other broker hasn't had a problem in the past now, you do understand that this has sort of a, an inherent problem because if I've got two buyers that are asking me, tell me what I need to do to buy the house. What price do I need to offer so I'm going to get this house? And I've got two of them. Well, do I give them both the same number, right? Uh, if, if you were one of my buyers, would you want to know what I knew about other buyers and the offers that they were making? You, you see what I'm saying, right? Now, some brokerages don't have any rules against this. Um, this doesn't say, it says, notice what it says, broker individually or through its associate licensees. That's this part here. I don't know if I can. Um, maybe working with many prospective buyers at the same time. These buyers may have an interest in. 
um, the same property. Some of these properties may be listed with the broker. Broker will not limit or restrict any particular buyer from making an offer on any particular property. Right now, it doesn't actually say me individually, right, representing multiple buyers. I have agents that I coach that have written offers from three buyers on the same house. Now, I'm not I'm I, I'm not sure how you advise people on price, um, but that's up to you. What would make it cleaner, and what many agents do, is they pick the one they think is the strongest and then maybe refer the other two to somebody else for the purpose of writing that offer, knowing they're probably not going to pay a referral fee because their buyer that they're representing, you know, is going to be able to offer more. But I'm just saying this says you can represent more than one buyer, even on the same property. Uh, and dual agency, of course, is if it's our listing and that, you know, that it may be that we, we, as the brokerage are representing both the buyer and the seller at the same time. Now, one of the parts about this that is often ignored is this part here. Offers are not necessarily confidential. Now, one of the most common misunderstandings about listings and what can the listing agent say is listing agents, if you call them up and you say, do you have any offers? And they say, yeah, I got, you know, three offers in. Great. Can you tell me, you know, how much they are? Are they at the list price, below the list price, more than the list price? And there are a number of agents that when asked that question will tell you, no, I can't tell you that. It's illegal. It's unethical. It's immoral for me to tell you what the amounts are of other offers. That, by the way, is not what the standard listing agreement says. The standard California Association of Realtors residential listing agreement explicitly says that the listing agent is authorized to disclose to other people the number of and amounts of any offers that they've received. That's what the listing agreement says. It is not illegal. It is not unethical, immoral. In fact, I would argue that if my job is to get the seller the highest price, sometimes telling other agents what our highest price is, is likely to get the seller more money. But that whole idea is sort of mentioned here. Offers are not necessarily confidential. Buyers advise that seller or listing agent may disclose the existence, terms, or conditions of the buyer's offer unless all parties and their agent have signed a confidentiality agreement. Where would you get one of those? How many, where would you get a confidentiality agreement that you could use? And the answer is in CAR, ZIP forms, now known as Lone Wolf Technologies, there's a confidentiality agreement. And one of the things that I've talked to buyers about is we can have a confidentiality agreement that we send and have them sell it that says they're not going to disclose our offer to other people, right? We can do that. And sometimes the buyer's like, oh, really? We can do that? That's great. Do we know if that's going to keep the listing agent from telling now? We, we, we don't really know. Is there any way to find out now? There really isn't any way to find out. Um, I'm often asked, can we make the listing agent show us what the other offers are and how much? And the answer is no, no, you can't do that. There's no way to do that, right? But the I would mention that if we have a confidentiality, confidentiality agreement, they're not supposed to, but that otherwise they are allowed to tell, right, what our offer is, and they may use it to bid it up. That's why sometimes timing the offer becomes important. So, for example, if the seller is taking offers at a particular day, it's sometimes better not to send your offer in too early because they may, I, I would tell other people, right? I, if I were the listing agent, I might be mentioning it to other people. Hey, our top offer right now is 1.4. You need to beat that, you know, if you're interested. And then... I had a, a, a transaction in East Palo Alto where um, we had listed it for 999888, something like that. It sold for 1.2. 
and as they came in 1.1 came in and then I somebody called me and I said you know 1.1 they came in with 1.145 somebody called me I got 1.145 somebody made an offer of 1.165 you know it just keep kept going up and up and up to eventually got to 1.2 um, so I'm asked if the listing agent has to share the offer details and answers no there is nothing in any of this that says that the listing agent has to give you a copy of the offer details you just you don't know right and sometimes uh, those of you that are you know maybe um not as trusting right when the when the agent the listing agent says i got five offers do you know for sure that they have five offers and the agent says and they're all above list price do you know for sure and the answer is you don't Right, you don't know for sure. Right now, as a listing agent, because I have other listing agents ask me, why shouldn't shouldn't I just tell people I got multiple offers? Not only is that a problem in the fair and honest part of the agency thing, but it also can backfire on you. Right. So if I don't have five offers, I'm not going to tell you I have five offers. Because what might happen is you're going to decide that you don't want to compete against five other offers and go away. And now I got no offers, right? So it's it's dangerous to exaggerate the number of offers or the amount that you have. But this is a conversation you might need to have with the buyer. So that's why timing the offer so that they get it in time for it to be presented, but not enough time. This is called shopping the offer bidding up the offer not enough time don't give the agent a day or two to uh, tell everyone hey we got an offer but and by the way listing agents will do this they've got all these agents and they've got buyers that have been nibbling about the property have downloaded maybe disclosures made inquiries and now an offer comes in a typical listing agent might go back to that list and say hey everybody we got an offer if you're interested in this property now's the time to come to the table it's about to go right in order to get more offers um buyer and seller under oops, buyer and seller understand that broker may represent more than one buyer or more than one seller and even both buyer and seller on the same transaction and consents to such relationships i'm having trouble highlighting it the way i want but you get the idea. By the way, as a broker, I can tell you, and I managed at one point a five office group that had about 600 agents. And probably 90% of all of the contract related questions could have been answered if somebody had actually read the contract, right? And a lot of the forms, well, a lot of agents have never read the whole contract. I, I know you guys are, are, are different, that obviously you're you're you are you're in this you're in the selling you're in the selling wire fraud and electronic funds transfer advisory and i i would say to people do you know that there is um fraud on the internet so that there's email fraud and there's fraud obviously going on and so one of the things that we need to be careful of when we're in the transaction is to make sure that your email is not compromised and that the deposits are made into escrow and everything is going to be you know clean and you're not going to have to worry about that i have been at offices where uh, an agent was representing a buyer the buyer gets an e the agent's email was hacked right by the way if you have a weak email service that agent by the way had yahoo right was their email they've improved some since then but not a lot but their their um, email was hacked, and so by reading the email, the scammers had figured out that they were in a transaction and that there was a deposit, there was money that was going to be put into escrow over two hundred thousand dollars, and so then they sent an email to the buyer, and it said if you looked at the email address, zero, not O but zero rtc.com that's old republic title company.com but it wasn't a zero it wasn't an o it was a zero and they they had the logo they had it looked it looked really legitimate and they transferred the buyer transferred over two hundred thousand dollars 
into the wrong bank account, right? And you, you'd be surprised to hear this. They blamed their agent whose email had been hacked, right? Now, I'm just saying, um, if you're handling things like this, you ought to have a professional email service, uh, something that makes it more difficult to be hacked. Just saying, right? So here we are. We've reached the contract. We've reached the contract. And the residential purchase agreement, joint escrow instructions, date prepared. That's the day that we write the contract. Is that the day that the buyer signs the contract? Not necessarily. Is it the day that the buyer and seller have signed the contract? No, that, not necessarily. That is the day that the contract is prepared. In all future documents, addendums, contingency removals, all those other documents, it's going to make a reference to contract dated. It'll say box to check residential purchase contract dated. That's the date that they want, right? Whatever that day is. But I could prepare the contract today. My buyer could sign it tomorrow. The seller could sign it the next day. And the when the last signature appears on the contract, that's when the contract is said to be ratified, it's a complete contract, and the counting of the time periods, which we'll get to much later, begins on that day, not this day, right? This is just a reference day. It's an offer from, there's a property, address, assessor's parcel number, all of that was just pulled in because we used RPR. I think this is one of the ones I was um, playing with. That's um, a potential a, a listing, I think. Um, so purchase price offered is, you just usually put it in here. And then 1D, close of escrow. You're given two choices. One choice is what most agents do is they just click this box and they say, let's say 30 days, right? Easy peasy. Now, one of the issues can be is what day is that going to be? For example, it's 30 days, and I'm not looking at the contract. This is a hypothetical question. If I were to look at a calendar, is that 30 days a day? Um, uh, is that a day that uh, falls on a holiday? Is it a day that is a weekend? Is it a Monday? And why is that important? Because we can't close on those days. No, I mean, Monday we can, but you understand the problem with closing on Monday is the when does the loan fund right is it possible to fund monday morning and close monday afternoon i guess so but i wouldn't bet on it right i just wouldn't bet on that so if we're going to close on monday we might have to fund on friday now although your client may not you know see it right off the issue is they're going to be paying interest over the weekend when it isn't their house. And if they're good with numbers, they're gonna tell you, well, this is costing me so much money, I don't wanna close on, I don't wanna fund on Friday to close on Monday. All right, so what I might do is pick this box, click here and look at the calendar. So if we look at February 14th, like that would be, you know, maybe 30 days, I guess not exactly, but close. Well, that's a Sunday. The 15th is a Monday. I don't necessarily like to schedule those for closing dates, particularly the weekend. Um, what about the 12th? Eh, it's a Friday. One of the things you need to tell your buyer clients, and for that matter, your seller clients, is that the close of escrow day is really sort of a target, right? And that they should not count on it closing exactly on that day. Any of you with experience knows that there are a lot of things that could pop up, right? That could pop up 
that might delay the closing. The appraiser may be late in submitting the report. If the, it may be reviewed. Um, they may be underwriters sometimes are asking, well, we want to see a copy of this and we want to see a copy of that and then the review again. And you understand it's, it's a moving target. So if I pick Friday as a closing date and anything goes wrong, we're back to Saturday, Sunday, and Monday again, right? Which are all kind of a, maybe a problem. So I would tend to like to pick something maybe in the middle of the week, right? Maybe in the middle, right? What that gives us is a little wiggle room if it doesn't close precisely on when we can close on Thursday or Friday, we got a couple other days before we hit the weekend and it goes over to next week. If you just put down 30 days, you may have to be changing the close of escrow day, right? You may have to be changing that because once you look at a calendar, it's like, oh, wow, we, we really can't close on that day. And by the way, I got a question as we were going along, what do I mean by a ratified contract? That's a term that real estate agents use. It's you know when everybody that needs to sign the contract to sign the contract, fully ratified. All right, now this was just stuff that I had you know imported, so it's it's just just you know it looks sort of weird. My name's all over it, but um, agency confirmation. This is a requirement under the California Civil Code that agency be accurately confirmed in the purchase agreement. And I saw one just yesterday where the agent had them switched, right? What, what's the problem with that? The buyer's agent was listed as the listing and the listing agent was listed as the buyer's agent. Uh, that, that's not gonna work. So if you're representing, if the listing agent is not part of the same company you're part of, the same broker, Right, you understand now EXP is one broker and Compass is one broker and most global bankers is one broker, but Keller Williams is a bunch of different brokers because they're all independently owned and operated. You understand? So if if it's the same brokerage that you're a member of, you can't check the seller only. You have to check both the buyer and the seller. Notice how it's clicked in down here. But typically, the listing agent is an R broker. So we're going to undo this. Doesn't, doesn't want to go back. All right, there we go. So then and you, you put in the number, you know, um, I'm not going to necessarily do that right now. But it's there. I, I guess I am. And then the seller's agent, right? That would be the buyer's agent. Your name should be there. You're representing, oops, excuse me, the buyer's brokerage firm. Your name goes there and you're gonna to wanna to check on the buyer only, unless the listing agent is from the same company. So if it's from the same company, what we would be doing is checking, notice when we check that, all these boxes automatically get checked, right? Notice how they all automatically get checked, just to make it clear, this is dual agency. But most of the time, it's going to look like that, right? Like this. All right, back, 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 back. All right. Most of the time, it's going to look like that. Very good. Potentially competing buyers and sellers. Remember the possible, the PRBS, the possible representation of more than one buyer or seller. That's the form we spent way too much time on. Now we get to deposit. Earnest money deposit. EMD, I have I've had agents, you know, they're reading the, the private remarks, new newbies maybe, but reading the private remarks in the listing, and it would say, we want POF, EMD, pre-approval letter, right? With your offer. And people say, well, I what's a POF? <laughs> and um it stands for proof of funds, which we're gonna get to. It's on the second page. What is I've had agents say, what does EMD stand for? And I, I, I usually say something like emergency medical dispatch or something like that, but that means the earnest money deposit. What is typical if this is a residential property, one to four units, and you're in a competitive market, then it's common that it be 3% of the sales price. So if our sales price is 1,200,000, 
we multiply by 3%, $36,000, we would write that in. Where does the 3% come from? The California Civil Code says, dealing with liquidated damages, which is a topic we're going to get to later, that if it's a one to four unit owner occupied residential property and the buyer defaults and the buyer has agreed to liquidated damages, which means that the buyer could forfeit their deposit, right? If they're unable to close the transaction, the maximum amount that the seller is allowed to keep is 3%. That's it. Now, is it possible that a buyer could make a deposit greater than 3%? The answer is yes. But if I'm the listing agent, I'm going to tell the seller that on the plus side, it shows a commitment by the buyer. But you just need to realize that if that buyer backs out, you don't get to keep all of that. You can only keep 3%. That's just the way it is. Now, in a market where there's more, it's softer, right? Particularly, let's say I was writing an offer, and this will be a different class on an income property. Let's say a fourplex or something, and I'm looking, and these are this is a softer market in this area, and that there are um, the how the property's been on the market a long time. They're they're not being snapped up. They're not getting multiple offers. What I would typically do is instead of starting with 3%, I might only start with 1%. But we will agree to raise it to 3% when we've removed our contingencies. And this is particularly true if the listing agent does not have a termite report, a property inspection, and all that stuff together. Right? Because there's an argument, why should I put in all this money when you haven't provided any documentation about the property? And, you know, there's a long way to go before we're committed to buy it. If it's a multiple offer, hot kind of market situation, you should know that everybody is doing 3% pretty much. So where now, by the way, just because there are boxes and things, it doesn't mean you have to check it. I got an offer from an agent. I won't say the name of the, comp the company, but it was Compass. And they, the, it was one of the, this person's been around a long time, one of the worst offers I've ever seen. And it was like randomly boxes were checked and things were written in and it was just bizarre. Just because there's boxes, it doesn't mean you have to check things, right? There are certain things you might want to check, but just don't, you know, just randomly go in and start checking boxes. So why am I saying this now? Look at what it says about the deposit. Buyer direct deposit. Buyer shall deliver deposit directly to escrow holder by electronic funds transfer. That's the default setting. Now, typically, I don't mess with it. I see agents picking cashier's check or personal check. I, I don't mess with it. Does the escrow or the seller really care whether or not it's an electronic funds transfer, a personal check, or a cashier's check, as long as the money actually gets into escrow. And um, somebody raised their hand. I don't know if that means you have a question or not. If you do, type it in or wait. But I'm not, I don't, I don't know. It may just be somebody waving at me. So um, so sometimes people say, well, I'm going to do a personal check or I'm going to do another. I, don't, I just leave it alone, personally. Then it says within three business days. If I'm, if this is a competitive like there are multiple offers. I'm going to change that. And one of the one of the things, like if I'm a listing agent that I'm concerned about is, is that you and your buyer are making offers on multiple properties at the same time, right? Which is understandable because the buyer keeps saying, well, you know, every time we make an offer, there's multiple offers and I don't get it. So if the seller can have multiple offers, why can't I make multiple offers? So I want to make offers on three different properties. Now, how do you get away with that? And by the way, I have agents ask me, I, you know, can you show me how to do that? My client wants to make offers on three different properties. Now, of course, the question all is timing, right? And for some reason, it always seems like the one they want the most is the last one in the sequence to look at offers. Um, let me just see. 
can you exit a contract on a non-contingent offer? Well, let me, I'll talk about contingencies later, um, but the, we're gonna be going through that. And um, just contingencies are, we're not there yet, right? Um, if you're asking the general question, if there are no contingencies, does the buyer have a legal right to back out? The answer is no. Is it possible that the buyer could lose their deposit because they backed out? The answer is yes. However, even if the contract doesn't have contingencies, there are some things that are hardwired in and you can back out if they're not provided. A natural hazard disclosure statement, a lead-based paint, there are certain things that give you a right to cancel. There are certain things in the contract that says the seller has to give you certain things. We'll get to that later. All right, so let's talk about the deposit. If I want to make sure that the listing agent knows that we're not making multiple offers on different properties, because what happens is, and by the way, as a listing agent, I don't change the status of my listing to pending until your deposit is in escrow. I've had buyer's agents call me up and say, hey, I looked and it still says it's active on the MLS. When are you going to change it to pending? And my answer is going to be, when are you going to put the deposit in escrow? Right? When you put the deposit in escrow, that's when I'm going to change the status to pending. Right? Why, why am I concerned about that? Because if that buyer has made offers on three properties and they like one of them better than mine and I change it to pending, and then the next day the agent says, well, you know, the buyer has been thinking about it and they've gotten cold feet and they've decided not to go through with the transaction. They never put the money into escrow. You just need to understand that if the buyer does not put money in escrow, there's virtually nothing you can do to them if they back out. The only leverage you have to keep them in the contract and to control them is that they put money into escrow. So what I might do is I might say, next business day after acceptance, you can see I've written that in, right? We're not gonna wait three days, because three days, why do you need three days? Why do you need three days? Because you're thinking about it, because you're looking at other properties. Right. Don't. And, and by the way, once I've changed the status as the listing agent from active to pending, you understand I've sort of stigmatized my property. Other agents are being saying, so I saw that it had sold and then you went back. So the transaction fell through. What went wrong? What's wrong with the property? Why did they back out? Right. You don't, you don't want to answer those questions. Um, or by the way, number two, don't I, I can't don't pick number two. Right now, if you're an old real estate agent, right, and you've been in the business a long time, some of them may still be doing this. Now, if you didn't guess, I'm an old real estate agent who's been in the business a long time. And in the old days, in the old days, it was customary for the buyer to write out a personal check saying $36,000 payable to old reliable title company, right, or whatever. And then I would take a, a, make a copy of the check, right? And maybe if I was at least up on this, take a Sharpie and block out their routing number and account number so that people can't, you know, like start making their own checks. And then I would show a copy of the check to the listing agent, right? This was never a good idea, right? And, and the more you think about it, it's a dumb idea. Now, the question is, well, why were so many agents doing that if it's a dumb idea? And the answer is because there was a time when most of our transactions were bank-owned properties. And the REO business really had a negative effect on the real estate business because the banks wanted to see that. They wanted to see it, right? They don't anymore, but they wanted to see it then. So that's what we did when we were writing offers on bank-owned properties, and it got to be that everybody was doing it. So we don't want the buyer to deposit money with the agent. You do not want that. You don't want the buyer to give you a personal check. You don't want that, right? What does it prove that you took a piece of paper, a check, and made a copy of it and showed it to somebody? What, what does that prove, right? I, I could write out a check for 36 million and make a copy of it. What does that prove? It doesn't prove anything. And notice what it says here. Deposit checks given to agent shall be an original and not a copy. 
what that says is that you're supposed to give the original check to the listing agent. Is, is that really what you want to do? You do not want to be handling people's checks. If you do, you're supposed to keep a trust record of it. You have to take it to the broker. The broker is going to groan at you. They'll open up a book and they'll write it in, glaring at you while they're writing it in until you don't do that again. Right? Don't take checks. Right? I'm just saying, don't take checks. We want it elect. We want, by the way, I stopped doing that a really long time ago, partly because I was lazy. I, I mean, time efficient, right? Because if the buyer gave me a check, then I would have to take the check to escrow or do something like that. And that's a pain, in, you know, that's a pain. So I would say to the buyer, you keep your own check. You keep the check and you take it to escrow. That way, you know, they got your check. They'll give you a receipt. You'll see where the escrow company is. Maybe you can chat with the escrow officer. That's the way to do it, right? But don't take checks. Don't take checks. All right. Then increase deposit. If this was um, an offer on a softer kind of property, like, for example, in commercial transactions, we generally do two, an initial deposit and then we raise the deposit. And by the way, usually it might be 1% and then we raise it by another 1% when we remove contingencies. So if you were making a smaller deposit at the beginning, but then raising the deposit to 3% when the contingencies are removed, you would be looking at this paragraph about increased deposit, right? And usually what you notice it says, we're gonna increase the deposit in the amount of, so if we wanted 3% and that was 1%, we would add 2% here, whatever that, whatever that calculation is. And rather than putting in a certain number of days, typically we'd say, we would say, let me see if my form remembers this, upon removal of contingencies, it's got a memory, right? And so uh, let's say we did, um, oh, I don't know. $12,000 here, did I do that right? And then $24,000 here, right? Something like that, that looks like 3%. We didn't, we didn't give them all the money up front, we gave them some, when we removed the contingencies, we threw in more, why not, right? But again, if this is multiple offers, you wanna buy the house, don't mess with it, right? Not multiple offers, something a little strange. It's been on the market 180 days. Uh, it's got issues that you need to resolve. There's no reason to give them all the money all at once. If it's an all cash offer, that means no loan. And notice how boxes sort of disappeared. You would click that. No loan is needed to purchase property. This offer is not contingent on buyer obtaining a loan. Written is a verification of sufficient funds is attached with the offer. Um, it's attached with the offer. So hold your questions, by the way, until afterwards. A lot, especially basic questions. Um, just set up a time to talk to me after this, and I can answer those. All right. So. If I check the box, it says it's all cash. Does that mean it's all cash? Well, you check the box. It says it's all cash. It must be all cash. It's not always all cash. So, for example, I have clients who have the money, but they don't want to put it in the kind. But they could prove that they have the kind, but they don't want to put it in the kind. So, would it make my offer stronger that it says all cash? Does that make my offer stronger? particularly if I can prove they've got the cash. Now, we want to be checking this box that says that we are going to deliver to seller verification that it is attached. I don't want to check this box. It says without checking the box that verification of sufficient funds to close is attached to this offer, or we're going to come up with it. And by the way, that's not a good box to have checked because if you want me to change the status from active to pending, I'm going to do that until you can prove you have enough money to actually buy the property. Right now, I'm going to cover later that there's another paragraph that kind of sort of says that even if the offer is an all cash offer, 
it doesn't mean we couldn't get a loan if we wanted to, right? It just means that that's not a contingency of the contract and the seller does not have to cooperate. Right? That's what that means. Is it possible that we might be able to negotiate a better price if it's all cash? Now, by the way, as a listing agent, the way you smoke these out is because it says all cash offer, but they want 30 days. Why do you want 30 days if it's an all cash offer? Well, you know, they want to think about it. Well, there, you made an offer without contingencies, but you want 30 days. You, you, you know why? And usually the answer is because they're really planning on getting a loan and they need to get an appraisal and uh, that's going to take time. So if it says all cash offer and close of escrow is in seven days, 10 days, maybe 14 days, I'm more likely to believe that it's an all cash offer, right? Let's say the cash is a hard money loan, not secured by this property. Right? I, my, one of my big cash buyers um, always would present cash, but he was always borrowing money against equity lines on other property that he had, right? Because, But he could prove that he had the cash, but he would go do that. None of those were what are called purchase money loans. There wasn't an appraisal required of this property because he was taking the money against property he already owned. We would mark it as all cash here because it uh, essentially was, whether or not it came out of this pocket or that pocket. Uh, so, um, and as a listing agent, I, I pay attention. Uh, the all cash offers, oh, that's great. Uh, why do they need so much time to close? So assuming your, your buyer doesn't have all cash, then there's going to be a loan, right? And then what we would do is we would be putting in here what the loan amount is. So let's say it's $1,200,000 and we have an 80% loan. So the loan would be $960,000. Now I'm assuming that the you have a letter from a lender that preferably uses the words pre-approved rather than qualified, that says they can afford to buy a $1.2 million property with a $960,000 loan. What about all these other boxes? It says the loan will be conventional financing. What conventional means is not FHA or VA. Seller financing, eh, unlikely that you're going to see that for a while. More common in commercial assumed you're not going to see that very easily because very few loans can be assumed um and then it asks if it's going there's some more questions here um should that be written as a first loan didn't i put it in oh yes i thank you very much i was doing that to see who was paying attention congratulations one person noticed that i put it in the, in the wrong spot i i do that regularly throughout my class just to see you know, who's paying attention. Very good, very good. You would win the dollar store gift certificate. All right, what about these other boxes? So you're, if it's FHA or VA, you would check those boxes. Now, if we check either of those boxes, something else, uh, you see, is going to happen. It just added a form called the FHA VA amendatory clause that's like a totally different class to go through FHA and VA. Normally we're not checking those boxes. Um, assumed we're not doing that, other we're not doing that. This loan shall be at a fixed rate not to exceed. We put in something. Did you know interest rates went up a little bit? Right? Went up, let's say 3%. Now why is that important that we put in the interest rate? only if loan is a contingency. If the loan is a contingency, then and we put in 3%, and for some reason the market goes nuts and you can only get loans for three and a quarter, we don't have to buy the house because we've said we don't wanna buy the house unless the loan is 3% or less, right? Not to exceed 3%. Um, if it's a fixed rate loan, if it's adjustable, it's a little bit different, right? Um, are we going to have points? You have to put in something or not. Um, so if you put in, let's say two points, right? For example, 
and you can't get a loan at 3% interest with two points, then you don't have to buy the house. That's only if loan is a contingency. If we don't put in anything for points, then that creates sort of an issue because let's say interest rates are now at three and an eighth, but we haven't capped our points. We could pay a point or two and that would lower the interest rate below three, but we didn't cap the points. Now in the market we're in right now, it is better not to be making contingent offers on based upon the loan, right? You're, you should have your buyer pre-approved, right? And it'd be better if they went through DU or that's desktop underwriting or something like that so that they're further along in the process. All right, but a lot of times what I see, these numbers are all blank because we're not making loan as a contingency. And if we were gonna make the loan as a contingency, it's not contingent upon the interest rate. You understand we can still have a loan contingency, but it's not contingent upon the interest rate unless we put something in here, okay? So most of the time that's not there. Second loan would be if there's like, they still exist, um, but they're less common. There are loans called, uh, and how about empty PMI, empty, I don't know what empty uh, IT is, maybe that. So private mortgage insurance is not part of this. This isn't PITI. This isn't principal interest taxes and insurance. We're not making it contingent upon the maximum mortgage payment, right? That's not a thing here. We're only making it contingent on the interest rate or the points that you have to pay to get the loan, but not PMI, not property taxes, not hazard insurance, right? That's, there's nothing in here about that. So there are loans. What about a second loan? There are loans called an 80-10-10. And what an 80-10-10 is, you get an 80% first from a bank, credit union, somebody like that, 80% loans at better rates and terms. Then you get a 10% second from somebody else, could be the seller, could be somebody else, and then you have 10% down. Um, not a, um, not a, a common thing, um, not a common thing in this market. If interest rates go up again, it may be common. If you're doing second loans, if we click on this, there's a seller, there are other things that pop up, but we're not gonna get into seconds. FHA and VA, I already mentioned that. If you check FHA or VA in D1, this FHA VA a mandatory clause is automatically added to your transaction. It would be another class to go through what that means. Additional financing terms. Typically, if you're writing something in this box, you're doing something wrong. Right? I, I don't know if I've ever seen in the last decade or two anybody that has written in this box where it was actually an appropriate place to write something in. Right? What about I'm going to give them a credit to my commission? That's this is not the box. This is not the box. All right, not here. Don't do that here. Balance of down payment, that's the amount of money they're gonna to need to bring in after the 3% in the loan. It should all add up. If the 1.2 million down here is, doesn't match the 1.2 million up there, then you've done, you've done something wrong. Um, could you, how would you add an 80-10-10? All right, wow. Well, I haven't done an 80-10-10 in a long time, but we would click it here. And what we would do is we would say the second loan, 1,200,000, I should be able to do this all on my own. And point one zero is 120,000. So, right. So what that does is it means we have 10% down and you'll see that the 84,000 here when you add the 36,000 up here, will equal 120,000, right? So that would be the second loan. And uh, again, we don't necessarily have to check boxes unless 
we want to limit the interest rate on that second loan and make that part of it as a contingency. You understand the real estate market goes through cycles. If it cycles downward, which at some point it should, it usually does, and interest rates have gone up, I'm going to be spending a lot more time on seller financing and 80 10 tens and other things, 30 doing sevens and other things that you could use to finance the property. But we're not in that market right now. Interest rates are, I think, 2.75%, something like that. Um, but, you know, anyhow, that would be what an 80 10 10. And I know credit unions, I know some big lenders that still make 80 10 tens, right? They'll still do it. So they give you an 80% first, they give you a 10% second, you have 10% down. And by the way, understanding this, if your market is first time home buyers, are you up on down payment assistance programs? Are you, have you had conversations with loan agents about, you know, my guys can barely qualify, we have to get them in like with a shoehorn, wedge them into the transaction and find out what options they have. All right, so all of this should add up. How am I doing on time? I only got like four more minutes. Let me cover a couple of things. Generally, I like to get down to where we get to paragraph four. Let's see if we can do that. Verification of down payment and closing costs. You should be checking the box verification is attached. This is what is known in the business as proof of funds. What constitutes proof of funds, and essentially it's anything that the seller and the buyer agree to, is proof of funds. Um, they're asking me if an 80-10-10 has private mortgage insurance, the answer is no, because the first is an 80%, right? I really didn't want to do 80-10-10s today. I shouldn't have said anything. Now you're all curious, right? Maybe I'll get my my loan agent to do a class on 80, 10, 10. Because it's, you should know about other loan alternatives. I think I'll do that. I'll ask her to, she'll answer all of your questions. All right, what constitutes proof of funds? Copies of bank statements, screenshots of stock portfolios. By the way, if my money is in stocks, can I get it out immediately, instantly? All right, does it take three days? takes three days oftentimes to get the money out. So um, if I say, you just need to make sure they have, you know, that they realize that. Um, is it possible that the lender has verified assets to close, right? And if that's true, the lender in the pre-approval letter can exp explicitly say, we have verified that this guy has the money to close this transaction, right? And the listing agent might say, okay. I've had times where the buyer has taken their cell phone and took a screenshot of their bank account and I attach that picture. You get stuff like that. Copies of bank statements, copies of the stock, you know, screenshots and things like that. Appraisal contingency, is it or is it not contingent upon appraisal. If you don't know this, I'm going to say now, a lot of, we're having trouble with appraisals. And by trouble, I mean, there seems to be a tendency right now for properties to come in underneath the price. Why is that happening? It's because appraisers looked on closed sales. So if I'm an appraiser appraising property in the middle of January, 2021, I'm looking at properties that closed either in early January or in December, which means the offer was made in November or October. Has the market, have prices risen since October? And the answer is yes. In many areas, the answer is yes. So is it possible the property is not going to appraise right on the money? That's possible. Should you explain to your client that's possible? The answer is yes. In fact, there's a disclosure form called the Market Conditions Advisory, which talks about what happens if you make a non-contingent offer based on appraisal. Now, again, if this is a multiple offer situation and I have a, an appraisal contingency and none of the other offers have, a, I'm not gonna get the house. 
right? You understand if the seller is presented with two offers and they're the same price, even if your offer is higher than anybody else's offer, if you've got an appraisal contingency, they may not take it. By the way, if I'm representing a buyer and we have an appraisal contingency, when would we have an appraisal contingency? The house has been on the market 45 days. You understand the the it, it's it, the novelty is worn off on this property, right? The novelty is worn off, and they're not getting multiple offers. Now we go in with all the contingencies. The property's been on the market seven days, eight days, and Friday is the offer date, and the agent is saying, man, I'm slammed. We've got offers coming in all the time. What I would say to the buyer is you need to understand that if we have appraisal as a contingency and we're competing against other offers, we're not likely to get the deal. However, you need to understand, let's say we offer 1.2 million and it only appraises for 1,150,000. What that means is, is that in addition to your down payment mentioned on the other page, you're gonna to have to put in an extra $50,000 to close this transaction. Can you, will you be willing to do that? If they say, well, yeah, I could handle another 50. Okay, what if it appraises for 1100000 Now, by the way, I'm assuming, because you're all great agents, that you've done a good comparative analysis of the property you're writing an offer on, and you've looked at what has sold and you've called the agents with pending transactions to see if you could get an indication from them. Is it above? Is it below? What is the offer? What are you in contract for? I would tell you, by the way, many listing agents, well, why not, right? You understand you're authorized to do it. And so that you have some idea if an appraiser is appraising this property based upon the comparables, where is it likely to come in for? And if it's substantially less than the list price, you should mention this. You should mention this to your buyer. So the standard language is it's contingent upon an appraisal. If we are competing against multiple offers and your buyer says, I want it, I don't care what it takes, give me this house, then we would check that box. If we don't, we would 17 days is too long, is too long. 17 days is probably too long, but it might not be. Who would be able to tell you how long it takes for the appraisals to come in? Your loan agent should be able to tell you that, right? The loan agent should be able to tell you that. So one of the conversations you should have with your loan agent, this is a partnership, right? One of the conversations you should have is, how long are you going to need to close this transaction? That takes us back up to close of escrow shall be, right? How long, you know? And if they say we can do it in 21 days, don't, don't necessarily believe it, right? Add a little bit, things are behind, right? Get the loan agent to give you an idea of how long it's gonna to take to close, how quickly are you seeing appraisals come in, right? If they say, oh, we're getting them right away or whatever, you could change that, you could change that number. Uh, how do you protect your buyer by stating that they're only so that there's a a clause that we can put in that says it's the ceiling or the floor, excuse me. So I say to the buyer, 1.2 is what we're offering. Well, if it comes in at 1.15, would you be willing to put in fifty thousand dollars? Can you? And he says, Yeah, I, I guess I could. Do, I'll, yeah, all right. How about if it's one million? 125,000, can you put in 75,000? And they're like, oh man, I'd, I'd hate to do it, but I guess I could. All right, if it's 1,100,000, can you put in 100,000? No, no, absolutely not, absolutely not. So what we would do is down here under other terms, we would write in something that says property must appraise for a minimum of 1,125,000. Basically what I've done is I've taken the price we're offering, I've subtracted the maximum amount that the buyer said they would be willing to throw in of additional cash. And I've come up with the floor 
property must appraise for a minimum of, and I could write that in, right? And we would just write, we would leave it, it is contingent, but we would write that in, right? If you're one of my people, I would help you with that language. Um, is that going to make our offer weaker? Maybe, right? It all depends upon the listing agent and the sellers, how, how, how confident are they about the price is going to appraise? Again, any kind of wiggling like this is going to make our offer a little bit weaker. But this is something you have to say, it isn't going to help you if you write an offer for 1.2, the buyer only has $50,000 of additional cash. There's no appraisal contingency. It appraises for 1.1, the buyer doesn't have the money and can't close. They lose their deposit because of this. Do you understand you might be talking to lawyers? Right? You understand that? You might, you might be meeting with lawyers and discussing your strategy for when you get sued, right? So this is an important conversation and it sort of requires that you have an understanding of what's going on in the market. You write that in in other terms, the answer is yes, that's where I would write it in. All right, well, we've gone a little bit past 130. What we'll do next week is we're gonna start with loan terms, right? We're gonna start with that. I think we've, you know, I think we've done enough. Have we done enough today? Is this enough? Um, and this, uh, yeah, so we'll start with loan terms next week. We're going to go through. I'm willing to explain every line, answer virtually every question. Um, and if you've got like lots of deeper questions, make an appointment to talk to me, particularly if you're, you know, on my team. Anyhow, that'll be it for today. See you guys next week. Stay safe and healthy out there, everybody. See you later.